let us begin with the session. So today is going to be a workshop on PySpark and uh, PySpark is essentially a technology that we use for big data processing. So uh, we're going to be going over the concepts of uh, big data first and then we're eventually going to get into what Spark is and then we're going to get into what PySpark is. So uh, PySpark is just a name, a fancy name that is given to the combination of Apache Spark and Python. It's not an actual technology. It's just something that we like to call when we combine uh, Apache Spark with Python, right? Firstly, getting into the presentation, we need to understand what big data is, right? So uh, a lot of you guys coming in here uh, on this particular workshop, uh, you might not have an idea of what big data is. You might have heard about it, but you don't know what it specifically means, right? So uh, firstly, to understand big data, you need to understand what data is. Now you have a fundamental idea of what data is. Data is anything that is digitally present on your computer storage, right? And data is theoretically defined as the individual unit of information that is defined as figures or facts and stored for later processing. Now this data can be of three types, and this is what we structure data as essentially. The first is structured data. Now. If you have ever dealt with uh, SQL tables or Oracle DB databases, anything that is SQL related, right? So any data that is contained in SQL databases is called structured data. This is a data with uh, column names assigned and column names have values properly structured. Uh, if you want to run a query on it, you can easily run a query on it, right? So a fixed number of columns and values associated with uh, every row of that column and primary keys if needed and all of that. So that is structured data, data in a particular format. Now, secondly, we have semi-structured data. Now this is the trend for today. Today we use a lot of semi-structured formats. Uh, semi-structured data is essentially data that is present on your computer storage, but unlike SQL tables, it is present in the form of files. So that means that uh, you'll have data of different formats, but it's not in the form of SQL tables with proper rows and columns. So this could be JSON files, this could be CSV files. Uh, JSON files has a particular format with the curly braces and key value pairs and everything. Uh, CSV files means comma separated values. So that means you have a text file essentially. And instead of having columns that are separating your data, you have commas that separate your data. So that is what semi-structured data is. You can obviously very easily convert this uh, data into structured data by simply importing it uh, by proper conversion and processing into an SQL table. So it's very easily interchangeable as well. And finally, you have unstructured data. Now this is data that is random in nature. So if you convert an image file into a text file, if you open an image file as a text file, you'll see a random gibberish of information, right? Nothing coherent at all. So that is this random data all uh, bunched up together. Same as with MP3, which is music files, MP4, video files, PPT, and all of these things. If you convert them into text files, you will not see any order to it. So this is unstructured data. Now it is up to you to find any sort of structure in it if it is possible at all. So in computer storage, this is these are the three types of data that you can essentially have, right? So this is what data is. So what is big data based on the previous definition of what data is, right? So big data must mean something. Any data set that essentially satisfies the five V's uh, the five V's uh, which are mentioned below of big data can be classified as big data. So uh, any data uh, that has velocity, that means the data should be coming in at a really high speed. So it could be uh, terabytes per, uh, per uh, hour, it could be uh, gigabytes per second, it could be uh, terabytes per day or petabytes per day, right? So that's that sort of speed, the, the rate of data that is coming in should be extremely high in the colossal numbers. So upwards of gigabytes, like at the extreme end of gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, that qualifies for uh, the high velocity that we need. Next, the most obvious thing is volume. So when you hear the name big data, this is the first thing that comes to your mind, that data that is extremely large in size is what is called as big data. So that largeness is associated with volume. So uh, anywhere from terabytes to petabytes uh, is uh, considered as uh, big data, is qualifying uh, for big data essentially in on your storage uh, system, on your hard drive or your SSD. And then uh, we have variety. So the data should be coming in from different sources as well. So any in any real life scenario that you are going to be dealing with as a big data analyst, you're going to be having data that is coming in from different sources. 
So it's not just coming in from one source, like a sales data table. It's going to be coming in from a customer data table and a sales data table. It's going to be aggregated and you're going to be seeing it as a combination of views, right? So that is what that is what it means. It could be also that uh, one file is a JSON file. The other file is a CSV file. You're combining both of those uh, data together and you're getting your common aggregated data. So that is also qualifying for big data. So it must have some variety to it, different file formats or coming from different sources. Then uh, we deal with veracity. Now veracity means imperfection in data. So the data, when you're dealing with data that is on a petabyte scale, on a terabyte scale, you're dealing with billions and billions of rows of uh, information. So when you're dealing with that much information, no matter where that data has been collected from, it must have inconsistencies, it must have flaws, it must have uh, some sort of noise in it, and it must have some missing values or uh, wrong information as well, right? So that means veracity. The data cannot be perfect when you're dealing with real life data at such a high magnitude. So that is what veracity means. And finally, we have value. So the data that you're taking in uh, for creating your big data models should be of high value. So that means that uh, say, for example, if you're picking up academic data of some college or university, so there are some columns uh, for that data columns that you'll have is the student name. You'll have the student uh, registration number or roll number. You'll have something like the grades that the student has attained or the marks that the student has attained, the subjects that the student has taken. So uh, some data in that is valuable, some data is not. For instance, the roll number is not valuable. So if you were analyzing anything with the roll number, which is just a mere indicator of what the primary key of that student is, it's not uh, relevant to anything, right? You, that data is not of value. So that essentially means you'll pick up the name if you have to, uh, just for identification purpose, you'll pick up the academic details, the, the marks that a student has scored, but you will not pick up that roll number column. So that particular column, if you pick that up, even if it's in the terabytes, that does not account for big data. It, it should have value. So these are the five V's of big data that need to be satisfied uh, in order for data to be uh, qualify, data to be data to qualify as big data. So firstly, let us understand the initial solution that was created uh, to deal with the big data problem. So obviously, if you're dealing with uh, terabytes to petabytes of data. You uh, uh, even the best of computers and laptops today, the inbuilt storage size is like maximum that you get is one terabyte in laptops. And then if you have a computer or a desktop, uh, you can upgrade it to two, ter two terabytes. But uh, for a general consumer, that is all you get. It's like 500 gigabytes to one terabyte is the general trend that you get for today, right? So that is what there is. So definitely you cannot take this one terabyte of data and put it entirely on your computer and then hope to analyze it in a reasonable amount of time. So that is where Hadoop came in. Hadoop is a framework that was developed in Java to deal with the big data issue. So how Hadoop solves this problem is quite interesting actually. What Hadoop does is it uh, takes a computer network and there are a lot of computers that are attached together in a computer network, right? So there's a server and there are LAN wires and all of those computers are connected to LAN wires and essentially you're creating a network. So what Hadoop did was it found a way to coordinate all of those computers together to deal with the big data problems. So that means a certain area, a certain portion of the hard drive of each of those computers was reserved. And when it was reserved, uh, there, it basically accounted for the HDFS, which is the Hadoop distributed file system. So all of these computers act together to store this data. So whenever data comes in uh, to the HDFS or the Hadoop server, it gets divided automatically and is stored across all of these computers in an equal distribution to be able to deal with the size issue. So one terabyte of data gets divided into say uh, blocks of 50 gigabytes of data and 150 gigabyte block is sent into one computer and uh, so on to the next and so on to the next. So that is how you solve the storage issue by dividing that data. So uh, very large files in this context means the files that are of hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes in size. Streaming data access, each analysis of the data set involves a large portion of the data set. So the time to read the whole data set is more important. Uh, latency that is required to deal with the first uh, record. So uh, that essentially means that uh, you need a solution that minimizes the input output delay while analyzing the data. So if the data is coming in, you need to be analyzing it 
at a really high pace to be able to deal with such a large amount of data. And then commodity hardware. Hadoop is designed to run on clusters of commodity hardware. Now commodity hardware means that you have two options to run Hadoop. Earlier, hardware was really expensive. So uh, buying expensive server rooms and server farms to store inside your office and run your Hadoop server on would have been really expensive. What they came up with is that you can simply use the computers that you use in your office as uh, contributors towards your HDFS server. So that is what commodity hardware means. Without buying anything new, you're essentially using the workstations that are present in your own office space to be able to contribute to your HDFS server by uh, dedicating a certain amount of hard drive space and processing power to your HDFS and Hadoop server. So let me look at some doubts uh, related to Hadoop in general. So firstly, I'm getting is uh, the first doubt that I'm getting is uh, what is MapReduce? So we're going to be actually understanding what MapReduce is briefly because that is not the point of today's video. We're going to be understanding Spark. But uh, I'll just tell you what uh, MapReduce is uh, basically. First. Firstly, this is what the HDFS is. HDFS is the solution of Hadoop for storing data. Now, this is not for processing data. This is for storing data, right? You store using uh, the division method by dividing the file into blocks and storing it across various nodes in your computer network. That is also called a Hadoop cluster, by the way, or a big data cluster. Secondly, uh, we have the second component of Hadoop, uh, which was developed for processing. Now you have all of this data stored uh, in your Hadoop or big data cluster. How do you process it? So for that also, uh, Hadoop uh, had a second component, the processing component or the processing framework uh, called MapReduce, right? So Hadoop is capable of running MapReduce programs with various languages, as you can see, Java, Ruby, Python, C++. So for Java, you get Hadoop libraries. If Hadoop is already installed onto your computer or the server that is required to run it, uh, the libraries are already there present and you can simply import those libraries in your Java code and implement it accordingly. And uh, you can basically create a program that uses all of the nodes that are present or some of the nodes that are present in your big data cluster to run in synchronicity, run in parallel to be able to execute all of those blocks parallelly. Uh, whatever job you are performing on that data. So uh, instead of uh, having that data run uh, in a sequential manner where it will take days to maybe months to analyze that huge amount of data, you're simply analyzing each block of data on that respective node in parallel, reducing the time exponentially. So that is the advantage of MapReduce that you get, the processing element. So let us look at the architecture of the HDFS and how MapReduce would actually operate on it, right? So uh, the architecture is quite simple. So imagine uh, uh, generally the big data clusters and big organizations have hundreds to thousands of nodes attached together. Here we're only talking about four nodes just so, guys, just so you guys can understand what I'm actually uh, talking about here. So uh, firstly, there is the name node. Now the name nodes could be multiple, the data nodes could be multiple. Uh, there's no limitation that the name node should only be one node. It could be multiple nodes. Right. So what happens is uh, you will take the computer uh, that has the most uh, the, the, that is the weakest essentially and you'll make it the name node and you'll take three average performance computers as data nodes. Right. So whenever uh, you're coming in as a client to that particular HDFS or big data cluster, you'll start to upload a file. Uh, say it's a terabyte file. Right. Uh, and you're starting to upload it. Uh, so what will happen is you'll first contact the name node. The name node will then see which data nodes have the space. So it will check which particular hard drives in the data node have the space to store that data. So firstly, it will determine which data nodes you're going to be storing your data on. Then uh, it will it will basically uh, communicate the block size. So the data will automatically be divided into the blocks of that size, whatever block size you've set, and then it will get start. It will get started to store uh, on the data nodes one by one. So the first block, say the green block, as you can see, they, they are colorized as well. The the first block, let us say the green block, uh, goes on the first data node, and then uh, the uh, the orange sort of block uh, goes on the second data node, right? And the, the third, uh, the red block goes on the third data node. So imagine that, right? There are also two other colored blocks. I'm going to be explaining what that means in a second. So imagine you've divided it into green and orange went over here and red went over here, right? So whenever MapReduce programs run 
uh, on the Hadoop cluster. The green block will be executed in data node one. The orange block will be executed in data node two, and the red block will be executed in data node three, uh, minimizing the time by three. So it will basically divide the time by three. So, and the next thing that HDFS helps you implement. Now, this is not that prominent as we are only using three data nodes, right? If there were hundred, then it would make sense. Say you set the replication factor, the replication factor to two, right? So the replication factor essentially is a solution that helps you deal with data loss. So say data node one fails, it goes bad or some hardware failure occurs. So you don't want to um, completely lose the green block, right? You don't want to lose the green block because that is just a part, that is a part of the data that you don't want to lose. So HDFS, depending on the replication factor that you've set in your HDFS, if it's two, the green block will be replicated two times. So it will be replicated on data node two and it will be replicated on data node three as well. And if there are uh, replication factors three, if there is another data node, it will be replicated on that node, data node as well, right? So uh, even if data node one fails, you still have access uh, to data node, uh, the, the, the particular block that's green. So similarly, data is also replicated, whatever blocks are put on the data node. So say uh, then you uploaded the file on the data nodes, the client comes in to read the file, right? Uh, he wants to access that file that you've just uploaded, the other client that wants to read it. So what will happen is he'll be automatically connected. Once he contacts the name node, he will be automatically connected to the data node that has the, that is the closest to him. So minimize latency essentially. So if data node say, if this is in, uh, uh, say for example, Los Angeles, and this data node is in say New York, so they're all connected together for some reason if they're not closely located for that matter. So if this person is in New York, he'll be getting access to this data node because that is the closest to, right? Uh, if there all of the data nodes are present in one location, so, so it, in that case, it doesn't really matter in that manner. So the name node is storing where the data begins and where the data blocks end. The name node is storing that information, the data of the data, the metadata. So it will store uh, where the green block is, how many times it has been replicated and where the replicated blocks are, right? So that is what the name node will store. So in that manner, the HDFS essentially runs in a very conjunctive uh, sort of way uh, where everything is organized and stuff. Can we integrate Hadoop with Azure or it needs Linux system? You can easily integrate with Azure. Azure has a service altogether uh, uh, for that particular aspect. So firstly, Azure, uh, you can use Databricks with Azure. Uh, Azure is a Microsoft cloud service for those of you who don't know. You can use Databricks with Azure. And uh, it has all of the uh, cluster computing elements already been built in without you having to install anything. Okay, MapReduce runs on the same Hadoop cluster that stores the data uh, using the nodes to process in parallel. Yes, yes, it does that. So the server, uh, what, what is this? The next question that I have using map reduce for storing huge data so that using server is reduced or not so uh, see in today's uh, day and age server technology is really cheap so when hadoop was developed originally servers were really expensive so uh, servers are really cheap now they're not as expensive as they used to be so earlier when this was made uh, servers were really expensive but now we can use servers as well server rooms as well to be to uh, to use hadoop with right so it's not an issue it's up to you. It's up to the financial status that your organization has uh, and uh, how much usage you have for that particular uh, technology that determines uh, whether you will buy a server or not for Hadoop. All right. So let us continue now. Intro to Spark. Now we understand what MapReduce and HDFS are, right? So we need to know what the step up is, right? So Apache Spark is an open source framework, uh, open source, which means that you can go and look into the source code of that particular program and make changes to it or contribute to it or make any changes to your uh, code as well for your use case if you have any custom use cases. So it was developed specifically in mind with uh, cluster based uh, computing or uh, Hadoop cluster computing or big data cluster computing. It was originally developed as an upgrade to Hadoop's MapReduce framework for big data analytics. So keep in mind one thing over here. It is an upgrade to the MapReduce framework. It is not an upgrade to the HDFS framework. So that means Apache Spark is also a framework that deals with purely programming uh, elements, the processing elements. It does not deal with storage. So let us continue. So imagine, uh, firstly, we'll look at the Hadoop MapReduce. So big data, you have big data sets uh, present on your HDFS. 
you uh, use the MapReduce framework to basically analyze that big data or process that big data, and you get your desired output. The problem with this is uh, with Hadoop MapReduce, at the time when it was made, RAM or random access memory or physical memory was really expensive. So they used to use a, a disk for that or hard drive for that. So uh, say the big data was present on the hard drive, a certain amount of that data is put into the RAM and then processed and then put into the output section. And then the uh, data is picked up from the hard drive again, the, re the remainder part, and then it is put into the uh, RAM and then it is processed and then it is put into the output. So in all of that, what happens is when you're picking the data, when you're transferring the data to and fro from the RAM and the physical drive that you have on your computer or the hard drive that you have on your computer, there is an input output delay. What does that mean? That means that uh, that time that it takes for data to be transferred from hard drive to RAM, it is not much if you're dealing with small amounts of data, but when you're dealing with large amounts of data, it accounts to a lot. It adds up the time a lot, right? It makes your process a lot slower than it needs to be. So when eventually RAM got cheaper, now on your mobile phones, you have 64 gigabytes of RAM, right? That is how cheap RAM is today. So but as RAM got cheaper, uh, we came up with a different technology to deal with this particular input output delay. So Apache Spark uses the Spark engine for its processing framework. The usage of the Spark engine over traditional MapReduce frameworks emphasizes on in-memory processing and usage of shared variables across nodes. So this makes Spark about a hundred times faster. So for small data sets, for like megabyte data sets, uh, it, you will not see the difference. But when you're dealing with terabytes to petabyte sized databases, or data sets, then you will see how fast Apache Spark is because uh, over time it does not add any input output delays. It adds very minimalistic input output delays, right? As compared to when we were dealing with Hadoop and MapReduce uh, specifically. So you have big data, you have in memory processing. So essentially what happens is say uh, your block size, you have a particular block size of uh, uh, the data that is present on a particular node is about three to four gigabytes. Uh, that is how, how much data was divided and put on one node of the terabyte data set that you have. So it's three to five gigabytes. You have a RAM of eight gigabytes on your node, right? So that three to five gigabytes will entirely go into the RAM, right? At once, it will go into the RAM and it will stay there until the job is finished. So whatever intermediate outputs you get, whatever processing you're doing, it is all happening instantly because the data from the RAM is going into the CPU and the intermediate outputs are coming back into the RAM almost instantly, right? So it minimizes the input output delay. The only delay that you get with Spark processing is the CPU delay, how much time it takes the CPU to analyze that data. You don't have to deal with the hard drive transfer time, right? So that is how, that is how Apache Spark works with big data and how it uh, speeds up the process. One particular uh, query that I'm getting is because we now have more RAM as compared to the earlier days. Yes, because earlier even one gigabytes or two gigabytes of RAM was really expensive and a lot of people did not have it, especially in commodity hardware, right? So in that case, we had to entirely rely on the hard drive space. Today we have eight gigabytes of RAM in a lot of computers, four gigabytes minimum, Right, so that is the trend that we have today. So even in laptops, like general user-based laptops, that is how cheap RAM is. So that is why. So firstly, let us understand the next step. Uh, big data, uh, when you're using it with uh, MapReduce, when you're processing it with MapReduce, you can use Java, uh, Ruby, Python, and C++. So these particular languages have libraries for MapReduce, and you can integrate uh, that in your code and analyze that data with the input-output delays that you have. With uh, so MapReduce and Spark programs can be written uh, in a variety of languages, but when we use Python with the Spark API, so for uh, Apache Spark provides four APIs essentially. So one is for Python, one is for Scala, one is for Java, and one is for R programming, right? So uh, for those of you who are coming from a data background, you might be familiar with Python and R at minimum, right? And uh, Java and Scala are development-based languages for those of you who are coming from a development language. Right, so it, it depends on what kind of background you're coming from and what would be easy for you. But I would recommend Python, right? Because Python is very easy to understand and it is generally recommended if you want to progress in the big data field, if you want to do more things with big data. Even R, I wouldn't recommend as much as I would recommend Python, right? R is more uh, somebody who's purely uh, from a data analytics field, right? He does not do want uh, want to do anything more other than data analytics and uh, visualization. Want to, does not want to develop anything or uh, do some customizations with the data. So R is a very limited language in that regard. Python 
the best language i would say for data oriented jobs all right so aside from the performance improvement that you get from using the spark engine the integration makes it extremely easy for us to use the features of python seamlessly with spark features so that means other than the spark api you have uh, the matplotlib in python you have uh, scikit the sk learn library that you have which is for machine learning right you have pandas you have numpy you have all of that with python you can integrate that almost seamlessly with the spark data frames and the spark features that are there so uh, that makes it extremely convenient if you're doing it with python so essentially python with the spark api is known as spark uh, pyspark right it's the integration of python and spark so but that is straightforward i would say at this point so let me look at some doubts before we actually get into the demo so uh, one question that i'm getting is what is the minimum size of ram uh, required for spark so uh, if your node uh, is functioning if your cluster is functioning uh, particularly it is recommended that you have at least 2 gigabytes of ram on your node uh, to be included in the cluster uh, otherwise uh, you can still configure it in a way where it would run but there is no minimum requirement uh, unless uh, you are running a single node uh, cluster right uh, if you are running a single node cluster where you are doing it for training purposes and you only have uh, Two gigabytes of RAM, then it might cause you some trouble. But if it's part of a cluster, you can easily uh, move your way around it and do some configurations where it could run. So, how to get PySpark in system? So, uh, PySpark has a complex way of installing it. Uh, that is not something we are going to be getting into today. But I'll tell you how you can implement PySpark on your own by simply going to a Google tool that is there called Google Colab, and I'll tell you how how that happens. Is Spark open source? Yes, it is open source. What we are going to be doing today is uh, uh, we are going to be analyzing a Facebook data set, right? It's not that big of a data set because obviously I'm not going to be uploading a terabyte data set on the Google servers or the Google Colab, right? But when you're dealing with this at an industry level, it is almost the same procedure. You only have to deal with the providing the link to that data, and Hadoop manages everything. The HDFS manages everything on its own, so you don't have to really deal with uh, all of the blocks of data. it all it all happens seamlessly so we'll just go to the uh, chrome tab that i have open so uh, i have currently have my chrome tab open over here right so i have uh, already written some things down so this is what is required to actually uh, start up uh, this particular process right so if you sign up for the course or something that we have you'll get access to this particular code uh, but it's easily available as well online uh, in this particular regard so the first thing that you will obviously need is java 8 right so java 8 is something that is a prerequisite Uh, for Hadoop, so if you're if you're having HDFS on your system, you need this particular uh, implementation. And if you're running Spark on your system as well, you also need Java because Spark essentially uses JVM objects, right? So you need uh, Java installed. So that is why I've installed Java, and then I've installed uh, my Spark, right? My Spark and Hadoop combination over here. So that is the link that keeps changing from time to time depending on the repository. and then i've extracted it and then i've installed find spark which helps us integrate python with spark right i've set up some environments for my java and my spark so that uh, i'm able to access it and then i have uh, started with my python code so firstly i have imported my uh, find spark so we've connected our python with our spark by initializing the find spark module and then i have imported uh, one module that we're going to be needing for our session today which is the pyspark.sql module where we are going to be uh, writing some sql code uh, within the vicinity of uh, pyspark so the first thing that i would do is initialize my spark session right so uh, we need to initialize spark sessions before we actually use the spark variable right so i'll i'll be uploading my data set with the google colab implementation so firstly i'll play this i actually have to play this from the start so i'll be playing that firstly so it takes some time because it connects to the google servers and then uh, we are able to do that so the website is colab.research.google.com if you go there and type anything you will be able to do it you will be able to create your own jupyter notebook so this is essentially an implementation of the jupyter notebook that we have so it takes some time for it to download so let's wait for that uh, one question that i'm getting a pretty interesting question uh, where where are you running this is this on a hadoop cluster so a uh, spark does not need a hdfs storage system to uh, run but it works it is compatible with an hdfs storage system the advantage that you get with spark you can use uh, amazon s3 as storage as well you can use your own file system as storage as well but you if you have hdfs installed onto your system right which uh, we do have uh, when we are dealing with big data clusters you can also use hdfs with it 
so i'll tell you where the difference happens it's not that much uh, depending on the link that you have of the file it will automatically pick up that file from that location whether it's in the hdfs or the actual file system that you have or a amazon s3 cloud link it does not matter let me run it actually takes some time so sorry to keep you guys when i just pause this one for the time being all right so i'll play this firstly the problem that you have with uh, google collab in specific is that every time you start the notebook again you have to run the commands again so it's not like you are getting access to an already built linux system so every time you start google collab you're actually initiating a linux uh, sort of cloud right so you have to install all of these things again it's good for practice i would say but it's not good for actual development purposes Yeah, so we've successfully run the first block. Now we will set up the environment. This will take no time. And we'll initiate the Spark session. Right, that will also not take any time. So firstly, I'll upload the file. So it asks me an option to, uh, when I type files, it will ask me an option to select the file that I want. So I want uh, this Facebook data set. So I click on that. And once I've clicked on that, uh, Google will automatically put it into the drive and then I'll get the access to it. So 12% done. So here you can see the percentage. So is this building a Spark cluster for you? No, it's not actually, there's not a cluster involved. It's a single node cluster, if you may speak. So uh, if you, uh, it's basically like a, you're installing Spark on one system and it's emulating a cluster. Uh, if, because I'm not actually dealing with actual big data where we have terabytes to petabytes of data. So it's not actually going to cause us any performance issues. But we're dealing with a single node Spark cluster. Uh, if we had multiple nodes and we had Spark installed on multiple nodes together with the HDFS underlying storage system, we could have uh, used it with multiple systems as well. So 59% done, it takes some time. Let us uh, finish with that. So meanwhile, I can write some other code as well on the bottom. So we'll just go ahead and do that just a moment. Yeah. So firstly, uh, while this is uploading, let me type in some code, right? Uh, meanwhile, any doubts, if you guys have, you guys can ask uh, regarding this technology or what we're doing right now. So generally what you get with uh, big data is uh, mark if you're dealing with uh, organizations, right? Uh, organizations obviously want to boost their businesses uh, and uh, the way to boost their businesses is through marketing. So the marketing is the number one thing that actually is the success key for businesses, right? So uh, a lot of these organizations are online, uh, like Amazon, like Google and they have large user bases like enormous user bases and all of these users have data sets uh, they are generating data almost on a day-to-day -day basis uh, so if you go on amazon amazon knows what you like amazon has idea about uh, how many stars you've given to it products so all of that data amazon has so what amazon will do is uh, give you give that data to the big data analysts and the big data analyst will basically answer some questions uh, find some information out of that data give that uh, visualize that data or uh, basically summarize or document that data and give it to the marketing team and then the marketing team or the sales team uh, can uh, make their pitch based on it or make their uh, marketing strategy based on it to ma maximize profits right uh, if you're dealing with a data science team you can forward that information to the data science team the data science team and the machine learning team can implement models based on that data to be able to create recommendation engines and properly recommend the customer, know what the customer likes, right? So that is that is how all of that works. So firstly, we'll create the uh, data frame out of this data uh, data set. So DF is what we'll call the data frame, and it's it's like a Python variable. DF will like be like a Python object. DF equals to Spark dot read dot format so we'll specify the format that we actually want our file uh, to be so currently what we're importing is a csv file which is a comma separated value file as you can see facebook dot csv right and uh, we want to include the headers because the data set that we are dealing with has headers so the first row of the data set is uh, the header name and we'll put it to true so the header status is true yes we want to include the headers option infer schema so inferred schema and when we put it true what it will do is uh, it will automatically detect the data types of the values so it will create columns based on those data types so if it's a numeric uh, one two three four column then it will assign an integer to it and if it's a name based columns uh, name based column then it will assign string to it so the next thing that we'll do is uh, mode will be fail fast so if there are any exceptions it will automatically be detected 
and then load then finally this is the part uh, what uh, i was telling earlier on that no matter where you have your data you will simply put in the location here so if you have data present in the hdfs you will do something like this and given the location if you have data present in the uh, in the directory the present working directory then you will simply give in the file name so i'll copy the file name put it over here so and then i'll click on play so when that play starts uh, executing we'll have our data in our location right so just to confirm uh, first thing that i'll do is actually create a temporary view out of this data and put this data frame in the spark sql context right so first thing that i'll do over here is type in um what was it create or replace temp view right so the other advantage that you get with using python is also get this auto recommendation thing right you can get all of the details uh, of that particular uh, uh, function that you're using that is not the case that is possible when you're using scala sort of uh, command line libraries right so if you're doing this from the command line it will be a lot difficult for you if there is uh, there is any error or anything i'll assign the name um let us call this fb because fb is short for facebook and we'll click on pay so uh, what will essentially happen now uh, this fb name is what we are going to be referring to df in the spark sql context so spark will create a virtual sql environment right uh, virtual sql environment means that there is not an actual database that we have installed we don't have a mysql database but spark will mimic in sql environment it has created a virtual environment in which this data frame is going to be considered as an SQL table. So that is what we are calling this virtual table as, like FB. So code, uh, let us see how this looks, spark.sql. You simply have to type that and type in the normal SQL statements, select asterisk from the table name that we've just assigned it, FB, and put it in a dot show, bracket open bracket close, and then we click on play. Uh, it'll actually give us the data set as we can see, right? Um, so keep in mind that uh, this is something really convenient if you're coming from a database management background, right? You can see uh, these are the only new commands that you essentially have to deal with a little bit of Python. And after you've done the steps until here, if you're using simply Spark SQL, if you're not using any sort of complex Python code, right? This is how easily you can get started with big data. So if you're coming from an RDBMS background and if you want to deal with data that is of enormous size, right? And your SQL skills are really good. You can get ahead and basically create your career out of this, right? You can create a career in big data analysis as well. And then you can expand upon it with other knowledge as well as you move ahead with Python, with Scala or any other technology you've chosen to start your SQL, Spark SQL career with, right? So we've done that and we can see that there's user ID. So the unique primary key number, the age of the Facebook user, the date of birth, the gender, how many days the person has been on Facebook, the friends count that the person has, the friendships that the person has initiated, that means the uh, number of friend requests that the person has sent, the number of likes that the person has, uh, I mean, the person has given to other people, the number of likes that the person has received, and this, this particular number of likes has been divided into mobile likes, so uh, the number of that that has been done with mobile phone applications and the number of that that has been done with web browser applications like Google Chrome or Mozilla Firefox, right? So that is also accounted for, right? So let us do some analysis with this data now that we know what the column names are. So it's quite simple to do that as well. Firstly, uh, let us evaluate the average age of a person on Facebook, right? So what you'll do for that is, or we could just, the first thing that we could do definitely is type in spark.sql and uh, open up an inverted comma and pass our SQL query, select count and given an asterisk over there. So this asterisk means we are using all columns, all columns and FB. So when we do that and we type in dot show and we click on play, so it will give us all of the, the count of the columns, uh, count of the rows that are there. So there are about 99,003 records in this particular database, right? Um, so this particular uh, advantage that you get with this is uh, uh, you can simply write dot show as a Python function and you'll get your answer, right? Uh, there are other things that you can do this do with this as well. If we go with uh, spark.sql 
and given another query like select average and uh, we, get, we can give a column name so for instance if we want to go with age we want to find out the average age of a person on facebook we'll type an age over there in the average section and from fb we put in that and we close this up and type in dot show we do that and we click on play so it gives us the average age is about 37 so the current average age for an individual on FB based on this uh, limited data set that we have is about 37. So I think it gives us a right rough estimate, right? So uh, say for instance, the marketing team wanted that question out of you, now they have it. So the advantage of uh, running this with Spark is that no matter the size of the data set, uh, whether it's in terabytes and there are billions and billions of records, you can do it pretty easily, very easily. For this matter, it can happen really fast. If the cluster is big, uh, and the processing is happening in parallel on different uh, nodes. This will happen in almost the same time as it happened for me over here. So go on another and we can do some creative things with it. Uh, we can also find out the uh, count of males and females and basically uh, uh, do this average age thing uh, as sort of a male female thing. So let us try that. Um, Spark dot SQL select um, average age so once we've selected uh, average age uh, we also want something that we are going to group this column on so we want to group this by gender right so once we uh, include that column name and we type in from fb so this is basic sql by the way and uh, type in group by gender when we do that and type in dot show over here and click on play so it will categorize the average ages by gender right so for the gender that is non disclosed we have 74 for female we have 39 and for male we have 35 so it's double value it's a double value by the way right now but uh, that is because it's actually calculating average and average by default is calculated calculated in double so that is the so the next thing that we can do something more creative with it by the way you guys can ask some doubts uh, any doubts that you guys have uh, and then i can continue so i'll wait for like uh, 10 seconds and then continue if you guys have any doubts write it in the questions box all right so uh, there is one doubt um so the doubt that i'm getting is uh, how does spark operate in uh, parallel so uh, spark actually operates quite simply in parallel uh, similar to MapReduce, you're actually installing Spark on all of the devices that are present in your big data cluster, similar to how you would install Hadoop. So say, for instance, you have HDFS already installed uh, on all of the devices. So it's already Hadoop, uh, cluster, the Hadoop cluster has already been created. Now your administrating team will come in and they will install Spark on each of these systems, right? So when you go ahead and like over here, when I created this uh, particular data frame, right? And I specified an HDFS address, right? So whenever I specify the HDFS address, it will automatically take all of the blocks that are present across all of the nodes. It will give me a combined view over here, right? So we don't need to concern ourselves with block one, block two, block three, block four, so on. When we give in the file name, Right, it will automatically go to the name node, understand where all of the parts of the files exist. It will import that file in the data frame. We don't have to deal with any of the complications. We just have to store the file on the HDFS and we have to import the file using Spark. So that is how easy it is. Will any changes uh, made through Spark be reflected in the original database? No. So this is the advantage with uh, Spark SQL. You're essentially housing this entire data set in your RAM, right? So this is a temporary view of that data set. So here you can make changes, but you can create a new file with it, right? Or you can overwrite the existing file that you have, right? But it's not necessary that any changes that you would uh, create, any data frame changes that you would create will, will be reflected on the original uh, data frame. In fact, uh, these things, these uh, particular data frames that you create, this DF, is immutable in nature. So immutable means uh, anything that you want to change to this data frame as well, even in the RAM, right? You'll have to create a new data frame out of it. So say if I wanted to alter the value of 106 to something else, 
you would have to create a, a sort of new data frame for it right uh, if you wanted to add a new column to it or remove one one column from it uh, you have to you have to create something like df2 right so the way we manage that in spark if you want to create new columns in it is firstly we'll create a new column out of the existing column and then we'll uh, use garbage collection to remove this column so that we are not actually over our uh, ram limit or we're not actually over using our memory right so let's continue with that um what else uh, was i talking about yeah so uh, uh, now let's see how this can be integrated with python pretty easily so say uh, right here we had the average value like 37 right what if we didn't want to see this like in a table format what if we wanted to store it in a python variable that is quite easy as well so say uh, our variable name is x right and we want to basically have this data stored in that variable so that we can do further python for python operations with it right so we do that we remove the show because we don't actually want to show it over here the thing that we'll do is type in dot collect right we do type in dot collect and then since this is the table value this is a table value right so this comes automatically in the form of an array right so we cannot actually collect it in a single uh, sort of x and expect to see the value as a singular value so we'll treat it as a two-dimensional array so anything any any sql table that you will have in life is sort of a two-dimensional array so the first would be zero and the second would be zero as well so you're essentially taking the first value the zero zero position value right and that when you do that and you click on play it executes without any issue and when we click on print say for instance x uh, plus two right uh, so when we do that and click on play so instead of getting 37 and this you get 39 so i hope that is pretty clear as well so this is a uh, similar to pandas df so one question that i'm getting is is this similar to pandas df yes uh, this is similar quite similar to actually uh pandas df that's not a uh, difference between that and pandas dfs are also immutable data frames they cannot be updated as well so whenever you're uh, updating a pandas df you are actually also creating a new df so yeah it's it, it's uh in here when you're dealing with spark sql you're actually uh, this particular thing is is considered as a python object and you can do anything with it so here we reference it as an array and we collected the value and we can do anything else with it as well so this is this comes in handy the collect function comes in handy when we are trying to integrate different python modules with it so that we can take that data from spark sql and actually implement something with it so let us do something else with this as well all right we'll now continue so uh, the next thing that we can do is uh, say for instance we can find the likes received uh, at an average for a female and a male right so that is something that is quite uh, interesting as just curiosity point uh, at, at an average what gender received the most uh, receives the most likes on facebook so uh, these are the sort of interesting questions that you're going to answer for your marketing team or your sales team so average likes underscore received I think i think we're correct with the spelling ei always make sure i don't mess that up and average likes received and then we copy gender over there and from fp and we can what we can do now is something like i can provide an alias to this so we can call it average like right so i can refer to it as average like instead of something like average age and uh, then we can do a group by gender and an order by average like right so what this will do is uh, it will also grouping it will do the grouping and it also do the sorting so it will be sorted in ascending order i'll click on play so firstly we have the minimum average like so that is 67 that is for male for non-disclosed genders we have 157 for female we have the average like of 251 so gives us some demographical data right so we get that data out of this we understand how gender dynamics work on facebook uh, what sort of uh, the behavioral personalities of people are on facebook we can understand from this uh, these data sets that is how easy it makes it and then remember you'll always have this data in extremely long formats to give you an accurate uh, viewpoint right so if you have 10 records of data it wouldn't actually give you anything specific to go by but when you have millions and millions of data records you have a sort of an accurate answer as to how these things work right and uh, something else we can do with it uh, let us see let us find some let us do something with age demographics right so let us understand how many friends 
people have between the ages of uh, 13 to say 25 and from 25 to 35 so let us go with uh, age average age uh, average uh, average sorry not average age um average number of friend count friend underscore count and uh, we go by from fb now we can use a where clause for this right uh, age could be greater than equals to 13 and age is uh, less than equals to 25 uh, we do that and we click on dot show we click on that and we click on play oh actually i think uh, it's a moment what did i do wrong over here it's a moment so is the each correct okay uh just a moment yeah so uh, actually i got confused for a second there and implemented the uh java equal over here so i wouldn't i shouldn't have done that the and percent symbol doesn't actually work with sql so for the people with the sql background immediately notice that so i forgot about that yeah so when we use the and it actually works with that so so uh thank you deepak for correcting me yeah so yeah i use the and percent symbol there by mistake so when you use the and we get the average friend count 268 so that is the average friend count of a person that is on Facebook between the ages of 13, 13 25. And when we change this to something like 26 to say, um, say 50. So let us see how that works out. So that is a, a significantly less, that is 113. That also tells us about age demographics. Um, if we want to find out uh, the usage of individuals on Facebook. So uh, there are two data columns that are available. That is the mobile likes received and the www likes received, right? Uh, not www likes and the mobile likes. So these might seem like normal sort of columns that are there. We can also determine the usage of individuals like uh, at an average uh, people say between the age of SQL and some moment spark.sql select average and then we say if we want to find out the mobile likes we copy that column name and we put it away and we take average the website likes so Facebook from browser and Facebook from mobile applications from FB uh, where age is greater than equals to 13 and h is smaller than equals to 25 and we type in a dot show over there we do that and we click on play so we can see that the average mobile likes is about 123 cities gives us an idea essentially that uh, the web browser usage is quite low these days because everybody has portable devices right uh, the usage of computers for accessing social media websites is quite low anyway. So we can see that this from, from this particular uh, the data that we have, right? And if we change the age as well uh, to see if there is any difference between older people and younger people, so we can type to 20 greater than equals to 26 and 50 like the previous. And when we do that and we click on play, so we can see that it's less, but the ratio begin, uh, almost remains the same. So it's uh, mobile likes higher and average uh, web browser likes are low, right? So these are sort of the things that you can do with it. You can also perform some uh, complex mathematics with it as well. So these are sort of things that you would have to do if you want to find out any relations uh, between the data. So this is the last thing that I'll tell you about this before the course advisor actually joins us, right? Uh, just a moment. So instead of using the Spark SQL context, right? Uh, you can do some other things as well. So data frames are not just limited to Spark SQL. Uh, there are other ways you can refer to them. So for instance, if you want to uh, use something other than Spark SQL, right? If you're coming from a development sort of background and you want to do some complex modeling with your data, right? In that case, you'll use the group by like directly on the DF instead of using the FB, which is the virtual name for that in this SQL context, you'll use group by. And for instance, if I want to refer to a column name in group by, Right, so I can simply type in, um, for instance, H, for instance, H, let's use H. Let us group all of the data by H, right? And uh, then once we've done that and we want to do something else, uh, for instance, we want to calculate the 
average and for average i mean say we want to find out the tenure of the person uh, on facebook right so let us use the tenure column name so once we've done that uh, then we will type in order by so we will sort this data by the uh, let's say h we want to sort this data by h right uh, from lower to higher we want to sort it like that and then uh, if you want to sort it by lower to higher we can simply go ahead and given the ascending value as true uh, if you keep it uh, if you don't actually add this it's by default considered to be true right uh, if you want to actually arrange it in descending order right it will actually give you the data in descending order so firstly we'll do it in descending order then we'll do it in ascending order right and we type in dot show so once i do that and hopefully if there are no mistakes it should run so there's an issue with that tenure is not a numeric column all right so this particular column is not entirely numeric i believe so there's some problem with the data set in that regard so i'll not use tenure let us use something else let us use friend account yeah so there are, must be some string values as well so it's not entirely uh, a numeric column in my opinion then and there are string values in that as well so we'll change this to friend count and click on play so that is something that we have so we can see that uh, uh, there are people uh, who've uh, given wrong ages as well or maybe impossible ages as well there are as as high of ages as 130 that are there on uh, facebook so that is there and uh, the average friend count which i believe for the person that is of 113 age on facebook is about 334 uh, there's uh, 112 and so on and so forth if you want to see uh, a lot of these uh, to us so if you type in 113 over there we'll see 113 records we click on that and it starts from 113 it goes all the way down to uh, i think it will go down to one uh, and it'll actually not go down to one i think the minimum facebook age limit is 13 it will go down to 13 so it goes down to 30 and from 13 up we have this and if i simply remove this and click on this particular button, the play button. Uh, we get the data in ascending order as well. So it starts from 13 with the average friend count is about 164.75. And we go down, we get the average friend count statistics for every age. So this is how easy it makes us, uh, makes this particular job to be, right? So uh, hold down tight. Uh, I'll be contacting my course advisor now to guide you guys uh, with the career opportunities that PySpark has, the career opportunities that Big Data has in general to guide you with any of the questions that you have uh, career-wise. So I'll resolve some technical doubts before I actually do that. How do we uh, integrate Spark with machine learning? So Spark also comes in with libraries called MLib. Like Spark has a library called MLib. Uh, Spark MLib deals with the cluster-based machine learning computation. So basically, uh, creating machine learning models is a very daunting task when you're dealing with big data, right? So uh, uh, you're not going to be actually dealing with machine learning in a linear sort of format on one system. You're going to be dealing with creating machine learning models using the uh, processing power of multiple systems. So for that case, Spark also provides the MLib libraries, which you can use uh, for machine learning purposes. Okay, for data science roles, how much PySpark is required? Okay, so this is quite an interesting question. Uh, for data science, at a base level, you don't need PySpark at all, right? For If you're dealing with data analytics, right? Data analytics on its own is not that well of a paid sort of a profession, right? Data analytics is the entry level profession in data, right? It's the basic level profession. When you get into big data, you get quite a high bump in your career resume, so, so to speak, because you now know how to handle data at a very grand scale, which is the case with a lot of big companies today, right? So once you understand how big data analytics work, like data analytics when you're dealing with big data, right? Then using that knowledge, you can integrate that pretty easily with your Python knowledge, uh, say, for instance, uh, in data science, right? Or your R knowledge in data science. So instead of doing your data analytics, data science jobs uh, on small data sets, like you were doing earlier, now you're doing that same job on big data. 
and that is what is required in today's industry somebody who knows big data and is implementing data science with big data using data visualization with big data using uh, cloud services with big data uh, and then implementing machine learning and artificial intelligence with big data because your machine learning algorithms and your artificial intelligence algorithms will be extremely accurate if you're creating them with big data because it takes a lot of data together to create it so thank you so much for your participation and have a great day ahead bye bye